Good afternoon. Um, of course, I'd like to begin uh, today's talk by acknowledging the uh, traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present. Um, Oscar Wilde said that some cause happiness wherever they go and others whenever they go. <laughs> and having known Chang for about seven years, both Uli and, and myself, is Uli is a co-supervisor, I can say without reservation that Che belongs in the, the former category. He's funny, he's sincere, he's smart, and if I had a daughter, he wouldn't be bottom of the potential son in law list. <laughs> I think that this full lecture theatre does reflect that I'm not alone in, in this opinion, uh, and uh, although some of you with real daughters might beg to differ. <laughs> During his PhD, he's really worked hard and consistently. And I think during his talk, you're going to learn that he hasn't always been lucky, but he's really uh, persevered. And I think you'll appreciate, uh, as you see what he shows you, that he's really become a top-notch uh, experimentalist. And he's got some beautiful gels to, to look out for in, in his talk. And finally, I'd, I'd like to say that, you know, he set out to solve really quite a, a head-scratch of a, of a, a puzzle in the field. And I think that he, through his persistence, through his thinking through this, he's really gone a long way to synthesizing a quite satisfying uh, explanation and understanding of, of quite a, a bunch of contradictory data out there. And lastly, I'd just like to note that he has been accepted for a postdoc position in one of the top signaling labs in, in the world, uh, Viet Hornung, so many of you will recognize that name. And he'll be taking up his position there early next year. And I think the reason that he has been able to uh, secure such, such a, a prominent uh, postdoc position is really because he knows his science, he enjoys his science, and it is a pleasure to have him around. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing his talk. Thank you. All right, uh, is this working? Yep, you can hear me at the back, cool. All right, thanks for that, John, of course. Um, I was told to enjoy this look, it's terrifying, but I'm... I'm <laughs> um, all right, so I've decided to title my talk a nod to IAPs in inflammatory signaling. Um, and I really, it's, it is my PhD work for my completion. So we have massive and diverse communities of commensal microbes living all throughout our body. And the current estimate for the amount of these microbes is around one to one human to microbe. And these cells are really found to live covering our body and especially in the gastrointestinal tract. So if we want to look at a very simple schem schematic of this, we have this epithelial cell layer which will create a barrier to protect, protect us from too much interaction with these bacteria. And then we have this mucus layer, which again will add to this layer of protection, but also these bugs are, or bacteria have evolved to utilize this as an energy source. So we sort of offer this commensal symbiotic relationship by giving some energy. We also, since we provide this warm, safe place for them to thrive and survive, we need to keep them in check. And this is through things like antibodies and production of defensins. And the commensal bacteria living in our gut will colonize and take up space and, and really have less pathogenic strains being able to take hold. And of course, in, in, uh, and contribution back to us, of course, is that nutrients are provided through metabolism. Um, sort of sensing this environment and making sure things are kept in check are the immune cells, such as the innate immune cells, and also this talk to the adaptive arm. And they're constantly sensing and reacting, of course. So if bacteria levels change, they will alter uh, their response. So how do they sense these changes, these up, uh, increase in colonization of a certainly pathogenic bacteria? They do this through sensing these pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. And these are exquisitely defined down to even the genetic material of certain strains of bacteria as well as other parts and components of the bacteria, such as lipopolysaccharide, flagellin. And more of my focus is the peptidoglycan cell wall component, miramyl dipeptide, which is found in both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Sensing these PAMPs are these pattern, uh, pattern recognition receptors, and these include more plasma membrane-bound receptors, such as the toll-like receptors, 
as well as the more cytosolic bound or cytosolic found nod-like receptors. And these include the NLRPs, which drive inflammation, uh, inflammasome signaling, as well as the NOD1 and NOD2 receptor. And the NOD2 receptor is more focusing on my research because it's got the receptor for muramyl dipeptide, this bacterial component. So if we look more at the structure and function of this protein, NOD2, nucleotide binding oligomerization domain-like receptor 2, has the domain leucine-rich repeat. And this leucine-rich repeat, like a toll-like receptor, is this big arm which will bind to this muramyl dipeptide, and it will open up the protein to allow oligomerization. This oligomerization is driven through this central nucleotide binding region, so it will recruit more receptors to this active receptor, which will really drive this signal. And upon its opening up of the receptor, it will release the card domains, which are, here's the crystal structure of them, and it has dual, dual, car, uh, dual card domains, which are driving this homeotypic card-card interaction with the vital adapter RIPK2. So why, why am I interested in this, you know, this small component of the bacterial cell wall and this receptor? It's, well, it was the first gene... Please tell me this is... I could, it was the first gene to be uh, shown to be associated with Crohn's disease, this inflammatory bowel disease. Um, which is in, its incidence is increasing. And so there's mutations found throughout this receptor that have been shown to be involved in this disease. And these include leucine rich repeat mutations, which would render the protein unable to recognize this bacterial component MDP, as well as gain of function mutations in this oligomerization domain. So it would open up the protein independent of a ligand and drive downstream signaling. Another set of mutations that are primarily gain-of-function mutations, and these include these more rarer diseases, these Blau syndrome and early-onset sarcoidosis, and these are gain-of-function mutations. So again, it's in this central nucleotide um, oligomerization domain, and it will just signal independent of the presence of bacteria. So we're gaining an appreciation of how both these gain and loss-of-function mutations lead to diseases such as Crohn's disease. Um, so we have this homeostatic environment in the gut, and this bacteria is, as I mentioned, constantly being sensed by these immune cells, such as dendritic cells. So it will activate the NOD2 pathway through binding the receptor, oligomerize and recruit this adapter protein, RIPK2. This will lead to gene transcription, and this will lead to functions such as this TNF, IL-6, and CCL2-mediated recruitment of monocytes, and this will lead to more immune surveillance across the uh, area. NOD2 is also shown to drive an adaptive arm of the immune response, and this is through TH17 activation, which will also increase barrier function and, in, and actually increase expression of the proteins such as mucin, this layer, and act, uh, antimicrobial peptides. Now, what happens in a disease setting when you have this mutation in the NOD receptor? So you have this more inflammatory environment in the gut, and this is your mutant nod 2, say for a loss of function, you don't get this protective immunity, this in, it is protective inflammatory signal. And then you'll have a more barrier dysfunction, and then you'll have penetrating bacteria, which sort of a feed-forward mechanism. You'll have more immune recruitment, which is quite uh, inflammatory for the whole system. And this leads to this compensatory immune activation, chronic inflammation, and things like Crohn's disease. So it, I can really appreciate if there's a mutant nod 2 where you have a loss of function, but the gain of function is not as clear, but I could imagine these cytokines, if there's a lot of these cytokines, it could lead to this barrier dysfunction. So it does offer itself as a therapeutic target, this pathway, to control inflammatory diseases, such as in the gut. And to do this, we target this vital adapter, RIPK2. So you have this receptor, and then this adapter is recruited. So receptor interacting protein kinase 2, it's a typical kinase, and it's shown to be able to serine, threonine, and tyrosine phosphorylate. And its kinase function is really just to autophosphorylate itself. That's really all the literature has been shown. Um, it has these dual, uh, it has a card domain, which is not pictured here in this crystal structure, and that is binding to one of the cards of the receptor after it oligomerizes. The main function of this protein that we've gained appreciation for is that it as is a scaffold. So this protein, this kinase, sits at the receptor and will be ubiquitilated. And this ubiquitilation will allow downstream recruitment of factors and eventual signaling. So NOD2 and RIP2 in the bowel, in the uh, homeostasis of the gut, has been shown. I've shown you that today. 
It's also starting to be shown that this receptor and, and RIPK2 may be playing other roles throughout the body, and this includes in the brain, such as in multiple sclerosis. So what has been found is that in multiple sclero uh, sclerosis patients, the lesions in the brain have uh, peptidoglycan found in these lesions. So this is pictured here. And so they hypothesized that perhaps in an experimental uh, autoencephalitis model, where they sort of uh, model this bacteria within the brain to increase the inflammation, that perhaps Nod2 is playing this role. And so I've sort of detailed this here. You have cells like dendritic cells will take up this peptidoglycan and along with myelin-specific T cells will take through across the blood-brain barrier and activate this Nod2 pathway. So this inflammatory signal will occur within the brain. This will then result in more immune activation and recruitment as well as these T, uh, this T, uh, TH17 driven immune response against peptidoglycans within the brain. And this will then lead to neuroinflammation, demyelination, and paralysis. And what they were able to show in immunity in 2011 was that in wild type you get this inflammation, but in the NOD2 and RIPK2 knockout, it was protecting, protecting the mouse cohort to some degree against the clinical score. So increased score means more paralysis. So this implicated that. The NOD2 pathway seems to be aiding in the progression of this disease. So we saw this, and we were in a really good position, and I just want to detail Guillaume Lesen, is the chemist driving this compound. We were, able, we were able to publish that the use of a RIPK2 inhibitor, this vital adapter, if you inhibit it, you can control the disease uh, progression in this multiple sclerosis model. So we have WEHI345, this ATP analog, will bind to the kinase domain, and it will decrease the overall cytokines within the mice. And this will then lead to this clinical score being protected. And we saw half the cohort of mice showing this protection against inflammation and then paralysis. So the literature detailing targeting this protein for an inflammatory response, this is again this crystal structure bound to a kinase inhibitor. The literature has said if you bind a kinase inhibitor to this kinase, it will stop downstream signaling, and this is what they thought would be because it would stop autophosphorylating itself. When we had a look at it with our inhibitor, we started to appreciate that it wasn't the autophosphorylation nature of the protein. It was actually the fact that when the kinase inhibitor bound to the protein, it would change its conformation and break interacting partners. And we could show this when we purified RIPK, uh, we, well, sorry, when we purified interacting proteins, so CIP1 and XIP purified them GST tagged, we were able to pull out RIPK2 from supernatant and we could elute. So when we put the compound in, it would elute and break interacting species, uh, specifically these. So we started to understand, well, perhaps it is not the kinase activity of the protein that's important, it's the overall structure of it. And that's where my PhD came in. That's where a big question was, all right, what is this compound doing? to this protein? How is it breaking the interaction? And I decided to take a structural biology approach um, to this question. And the big aim was to purify human recombinant RIPK2 and bind it with the compound and see if we can get a crystal structure. And I'll only detail due to time, just one step of this purification process. But what I was able to do is purify large amounts of this protein, and it's very pure concentrate it, and then when using the C3 facility, got some really nice looking crystals. I was very proud of this. This one was my favorite, and, but it was salt, so I, it's not my favorite anymore. Um, <laughs> so we took these crystals and we went to Monash, the uh, synchrotron, um, and through you know, really dedicated help through Anisha and Isa, they, they were able to solve this structure for me of RIPK2 bound to this inhibitor. But I don't know how the structural biologists do it. It was a lot of work. and we didn't get our answer because it didn't have these key residues being resolved, these alpha C helix, the activation loop, and even a part of my compound wasn't resolved. So I couldn't see how it was impacting on the overall structure. So I've sort of added them in just to appreciate that these are the key residues that I needed and they weren't there. This is probably what they'll look like. <clears throat> so it is ongoing work. I'm sorry, structural biologist, that's probably very insulting. Um, <laughs> so. It is ongoing work, and I can purify large amounts of the protein, so I am going to continue this in the last leg of my PhD, because um, I really do want to find out how it is impacting. 
because we think it is duly, uh, pure, purely because of this breaking into the, the interaction. So these interacting partners, I mentioned them, these IAPs, let's put this in the context of the signaling pathway. So we have our bacteria and the bacterial component MDP enters the cell through an endosome. It will recruit this NOD2 receptor, will come along to the endosome and grab it through the leucine rich repeat, oligomerize and recruit RIPK2, this kinase that we target. It is a scaffold protein, and this scaffolding is driven through, as I mentioned, this CIP1 and 2 and XIP proteins. Either These are E3 ligases. They'll ubiquitolate the protein as a scaffold and recruit downstream factor LUBAC. LUBAC is an E3, complex, E3 ligase complex, which will linearly ubiquitolate the ubiquitin that's already present and possibly the protein as well. And this is important to recruit more downstream factors, TAC1 kinase, as well as the IKK complex. The phosphorylation event through TAC1 will activate this complex, and TAC1 will also give crosstalk to the MAP kinase pathway. So a lot of phosphorylation events. This will lead to the activation, as I mentioned, the IKK complex, which can phosphorylate downstream factors. Now we have these transcription factors which are bound and will be found in the cytosol. IKB alpha will keep it inhibited, but will be degraded upon phosphorylation. These transcription factors are now free to enter the nucleus after phosphorylation, and that's what they do. And this will allow this downstream signaling event to occur, and we get this upregulation of cytokines, these inflammatory responses occurring, such as TNF, IL-6, and CCL2. Now, if we put in the context of this inhibitor, I want to focus on this part of the pathway, this scaffolding event, and how are these proteins involved? Because they're breaking away, they must be important. So the literature is divided, as John mentioned. There's, it's a bit murky, the literature on their roles. So on the, on the blue side, we have a sort of a, a big paper by Maya Seller saying that CIP1 and 2 are required to drive this signal. And on the red side, we have XIP as the vital IAP. And both sides really claim that their IAP is the main driver. And neither one really addresses either side. So if we just focus on the blue team, the CIAPs, they state that CIAPs are required for not signaling, so they are required for this signaling event. They directly bind to RIP2 and drive this ubiquitolation event. And, and something that really sort of was very important to me was the fact that they claim that you can therapeutically target this CIAP and it will help inflammatory disease. So it was my PhD, it was at the start, and I'm all excited. Let's address this sort of divide. So that's the question, which CIPs or XIPs driving NOD2 signaling? So to do this, I wanted to address it all in one question, unlike everyone else. They picked a side. Let's, I wanted to use our black six knockout mice, CIP1, CIP2, XIP, and RIPK2, that negative control. If it's gone, the signal won't occur. Took the bone marrow from these and generated bone marrow-derived macrophages as the model for my system. Prime them with interferon. This will upregulate the NOD2 pathway signal, as well as activate the macrophages to be able to phagocytize the bacterial component MDP. And just a reminder, I'm going to be showing, just a heads up, I'm showing you some Western blots. So look for these phosphorylation events, this MAP kinase pathway, as well as the transcription factor phosphorylation or degradation of the IKB alpha unit. So when I did this, you know, I, I warned you. All right. Um, <laughs> So we're looking at these phosphorylation events, okay? So focus on the phosphorylation events and the degradation of IKB alpha. At half an hour after priming and stimulation, you will see the, uh, the activation markers occurring, phosphorylation and degradation. When you remove this vital adapter, this signal no longer occurs. When you knock out I XIAP, the signal is also unable to continue. So it, it implicates that this IAP is vital for signaling. When we look at CIP1 knockouts and CIP2 knockouts, it is shown like wild type. So already we can't repeat what the paper was showing. So CIP1 and 2 aren't uh, involved in driving this part of the signaling pathway. A question we had is perhaps in the absence of CIP1, CIP2 can come along and do the job that CIP1 is required to do. So I took CIP1 and two double knockouts. So again, these activation markers are occurring at half an hour. When you introduce the XIP knockout on top, they aren't signaling at all. So that's starting to be consistent. 
And in three mice of the double knockout, this signal is still occurring. So CRP1 and 2 redundancy is not playing a role. I wanted to look in mouse and man, so I took our THP1 monocytes. This is a human model uh, for this signaling pathway. And using this CRISPR-Cas9 technology to knock out to create clonal populations, so in this case the target genes were the IAP proteins, what it would do is using your sgRNA, just guide you to your target and it will induce a double-stranded nick. And a lot of people think that after this process, it's just through magic that you really get your knockout. But it's actually not that. It's actually non-homologous end joining. So this is an error-prone repair mechanism, which will either induce a frame shift and mutation or an early stop codon, and that's what I essentially got. Generated these CIP knockouts and the double to check if they were overtaking each other's role and the XIP knockout. So again, focus on these activation markers. At one hour, they were occurring in the wild type. In the XIP knockout, it was not occurring. And in the CIP1 and two knockouts, this was occurring as wild type, as well as the double. So both in mouse and man, I can't seem to find the role that CIP1 and 2 are playing. But XIP most definitely is vital. So after this, this signaling event occurs, you get cytokine production. I wanted to look at that. Perhaps they were playing some other role that will drive this cytokine production. So I went back to these bone marrow-derived macrophages. After 24 hours of treatment, looked through ELISA at TNF and IL-6, these inflammatory cytokines. And when compared to the wild type in red, after 24 hours, you see a strong induction of cytokines. The CRP1 and 2 are still signaling. XIP and RIP2, these vital adapters, are not able to signal. So, and in fact, I've got to point out, CRP2 had a stronger signal. So these early signaling events are not occurring differently in the CIP1 and 2 knockouts. I wanted to ask the question, well, perhaps ubiquitilation is being altered. They're E3 ligases. And in our lab, we have these ubiquitin binding domains which will pull out anything that's ubiquitilated within a cell. So I wanted to establish this system in the THP1 monocytes. And after 15 to 20 minutes, you see this strong induction of ubiquitilation, this scaffolding event occurring. What hasn't been shown in the literature and, and I got excited about was that XIP itself is also ubiquitilated following uh, this stimulation, this MDP. And this, of course, corresponds with downstream activation. At the later time points, we also observe this from zero to half an hour, this strong induction. And just to point out, that single, this signal gets turned off over time. So you can see decreased ubiquitilation as well as XIP and the downstream factors. So to understand what this ubiquitin nation is doing, and I wanted to see, well, what is this on XIP? What function is it playing? We looked at the exact linkages with, on the ubiquitin itself. So ubiquitin can be added on the lysine of proteins, but also on the lysine of the ubiquitin. And that really dictates what it does in a cell. This includes lysine 48, which will be the proteasomal signal that will degrade the protein. But you also have linear and lysine 63, which are involved in recruiting factors or shuttling the complex around the cell. And in our lab, and I just need to thank Alex in our lab, she purified recombinant de lasers, which target specific pro, uh, ubiquitin linkages. So if XIP was linearly ubiquitilated biochemically, we could remove this linkage and observe it on Western blot and it would be, it would be uh, removed from the protein and you would see a collapse of the band. Same thing if you used other specific dubs. We also have a non-specific dub or de ubiquitolase which will remove all ubiquitin linkages to, uh, independent of which linkage it is. So the literature dictates that RIP2 is linearly and K63 linked, heterogeneous built on top of each other. So using this as a control to see if this system works, we take this USP21, this non-specific dub, and you see this collapse of ubiquitilation. When we use these other dubs, so they should be removing these linkages, this linear K48 or 63, the bands weren't really collapsing too much, not enough to be convincing. There was a bit in the lysine 63. It was only when I combined the linear and K63 because they're built on top of each other and they would inhibit the single dubs. When you combine them, then you see this collapse of the higher order ubiquitin, so the inhibitory heterogeneous chain. So I was confident the system was working. I asked the question, what chains are on XIP? So if you look at this smear, it's not very strong, but you have to reduce the protein to sort of optimize the experiment. This smear was degrade, uh, removed by the nonspecific dub, so I was confident it is ubiquitilation. 
The only change was seen with this lysine-63-specific dub. So from this, we concluded that XIP is lysine-specific ubiquitolated. And the collapse is reduced here, but more importantly, you can see collapse to a lower order of ubiquitin. And the addition, the additional, addi the additional, uh, the addition of linear ubiquitin dub didn't change this. So from this, I concluded it's not linear ubiquitin on XIP, just K63. So coming back from that little side quest, I'm still trying to work out which lysine on XIP is being ubiquitolated. The big question is which IP is driving the ubiquitolation on RIP2? So again, we take out all the ubiquitin from this, the uh, cell um, using these uh, ubiquitin binding domains. And looking in the THB1 knockouts, if we focus on the ubiquitolation of RIP2 in the wild type, strong induction of ubiquitin. In the, CIP, in the XIP knockout, this is reduced. And in the CIP1 clones, CIP2 and the double knockout, the ubiquitolation of RIP2 is unaltered. And we asked the question, are the CIPs perhaps ubiquitolating XIP, but they're not. This was unchanged in the XIP uh, blots. And of course, this correspond, all of these correspond, these knockouts, to normal signaling downstream. So these CIPs are not driving the ubiquitolation of RIP2 or XIP and not impacting on signaling. So I wanted to address the paper. They said you can therapeutically target the CIPs to inhibit the NOD2 system. We have in, at our disposal these SMAC mimetics, berinopan and compound A. Both will target CIP1 and 2 and degrade quite potently. The difference is that compound A will target XIP potently at very low levels, but berinopan will preferentially target CIP1 and 2, so less of XIP. So this, this slight difference I exploited to look at this question. So do the CAPs impact not signaling if you inhibit them? I took these THB1 NF kappa B reporter cells. So when you activate the NOD pathway, you'll get GFP production. And we can measure this on the facts and look at the mean fluorescent intensity. So when we did this, with no brunipan in the system, so CRP1 is there, you see this strong induction of GFP. As you introduce brunipan in low doses and you increase the dose, at the lowest dose, it's degrading CIP1, but the signal still occurring is normal. Only when you increase this dose further, so CIPs are already gone from the system, do you start to see impact on the signal. So it's starting to target XIP, and that's where you see this, uh, activation, uh, this in inhibition occurring. And I can show this at the molecular level when pull out all the ubiquitolated proteins and you see RIP2 is ubiquitolated at 30 minutes. The addition of berinopan and the degradation of CP1 doesn't impact RIP K2 ubiquitolation. Only when you use compound A, targeting CIP is degraded already, but XIP, do you see this removal of the ubiquitin or the ability to ubiquitolate RIP2? And again, the activation markers are key to this. You have this activation in the wild type. Brinopan is unchanged, but the compound A is significantly reduced. So to conclude, I really couldn't repeat what they were seeing in that paper. I conclude that XIOP is the driving uh, the E3 ligase in this system. You need it for the signaling, you need it for the ubiquitolation, and if you therapeutically target it, you impact the signal. Compared to CIP1 and 2, the removal doesn't impact anything that we were looking at. But there was still this paper, and so to this point, I couldn't repeat anything they showed. Um, but there was an experiment that they did. They injected this MDP into mice, and we thought, well, we better check that as well. So I injected MDP into the peritoneal cavity of mice um, and measured cytokines after four hours. That's the typical model for this system. Um, and by ELISA and looked at TNF and IL-6. And what we saw was that you have a strong induction of wild-type um, mice able to see the MDP and react in TNF and IL-6. The RIPK2 removal adapter stopped the signal as well as XIP, but CIP1 was reduced. And I was like, what the hell? Like, all of this work showed that they're not involved, yet the mice seem to need it to respond to MDP. So after the initial sort of panic subsided, we sat down and reasoned, you know, what could be happening? So we, we proposed a set of hypotheses. Um, one, perhaps in the CRP1 knockout, the cellular composition where we inject is different in the knockout mice. So that could cause a difference in signaling. Our in vitro assays, all the things I showed you, is just failing to show exactly what's occurring in the mouse. So something we're missing an essential component. Or finally, macrophages, the model system we were using, 
uh, is not really the responding cell in the peritoneum. So if we're going to address these, let's address the first one, the, serot the, cellular, perito the cellular composition in the peritoneum. So if you flush out the peritoneum in unstimulated mice with PBS, you'll see a lot of different immune cells, uh, macrophages, some adaptive and some innate immune cells, and you can measure them by facts. And Kate Lawler helped me a lot with this, and I'll thank her at the end again. So when we looked at this, we couldn't see any overt phenotype of the cells within the knockout. So nothing was really standing out to us that's different. Um, the CRP knockouts, the, the, uh, the leukocytes had no real difference, as well as these macrophage populations didn't have a difference, um, didn't have any difference. So from this no cell death, CRPs aren't involved in changing the, the peritoneal lavage composition. <clears throat> so we still hadn't shown in vitro what we saw in vivo, and I needed to sort of reassess this. So I flushed out the peritoneal lavage, uh, the, I flushed out the peritoneal cells and I wanted to treat them directly ex vivo, so no differentiation, to see if there's a cell type in there that's signaling different. So when I did this, that's when I saw the difference. These CIP1 knockout mice, the peritoneal composition was signaling less. So there is a cell type in there that needs the CIP1 for some reason. And that, that really led to this final hypothesis is, okay, the macrophages might not be the cells to look at. What else can we, we, we really appreciate in there? Now, the macrophages need interferon priming to signal to MDP. We inject MDP directly with no interferon. There must be a cell type that immediately sees it and reacts. And, and these include these small peritoneal macrophages. As I showed you, they were a really small percentage, so I couldn't use them in biochemical assays. But dendritic cells, the MHC class too high, they can react immediately. So I went back to the bone marrow and instead differentiated them to bone marrow-derived dendritic cells. Again, these do not need interferon to react. They can just react to the MDP. And so when we look at the cytokine production after this stimulation with bacteria, we could see that the cells are requiring CRP1. So these dendritic cells, compared to macrophages, need the CRP1 to signal compared to wild type. Now, they weren't rendering it incapable. It is lower but it is above the XIP and RIP2. So they could still signal it was just less. So we immediately thought, well, perhaps in these cells, CRP1 is driving those earlier signaling responses. But when we looked at them, these are the bone marrow drive dendritic cells. At one hour, you see activation in wild type. And in the CRP1 and 2 knockout, activation is still occurring. So the early signaling event is still happening. So our hypothesis really still left us with, well, what the hell is CRP1 and 2 doing? Uh, it's in dendritic cells particularly. Um, and being in John Silk's lab every Monday morning for two hours, we are sort of pressed with the TNFR1 pathway and the rumours are absolutely true. He has it printed on his bed. <laughs> I can tell you this um, as a fact. So every, every, mo every Monday morning we can see this and we think, okay, CIP1 and 2 are involved in the TNFR1 pathway. Perhaps is this involved in the MDP response? And so... I hope you've appreciated that in this part of this pathway, NOD2 needs RIP2, E3 ligase is XIP. We have this TNFR1 pathway, if we're going by the bed sheets. TNFR1 will bind TNF and recruit downstream factors TRAD, TRAF2, and RIPK1, another kinase in this kinase family. And this is ubiquitinated by CIP1 and 2. And this will drive NF kappa B activation and cytokine production. <coughs> so, we thought, oh, we may as well, we've got the mice, let's test it. What happens if you put MDP on TNFR1 knockout mice? And they were the same as CRP1. So they were signaling less. This signaling pathway, which we never would have thought about, I was happy to think of just nod two, just in my own little happy signaling pathway, this TNFR1 was signaling less. And we wanted to recapitulate this ex vivo, so took out the peritoneal cells. Is it responding here less? And it is indeed. The TNFR1 was producing less in these cells, were producing less cytokines. So that was exciting. We're still like, all right, how is this happening? And so I proposed sort of this mechanism, and I'll let's sort of step through it with this beautiful picture. So we have NOD2 binding to the MDP. You have this signaling pathway, which you're familiar with now. You get this ubiquitilation through XIPM, and this will produce low levels of cytokines, TNFR6. 
you'll also have interferon gamma in the system being produced. This TNF, this low-level TNF, will then activate the TNF-R1 pathway. So it will go either bind to its cell, uh, the same cell it produced or elsewhere, for instance, on this now activated macrophage. So it will bind and you'll get this recruitment of this signaling complex. CRP1 and 2 are involved in this process and they will drive the ubiquitation of this event and now you will get more cytokines in the system. So together you need both of these processes to occur for a, a whole MDP response. I wanted to see this directly. I mean, it, it, it sounds good on paper. So I took these macrophages, wild type and TNF-R1 knockouts. So these in the mouse cells. You see XIP ubiquitation at 30 minutes, as I've shown you before. The RIP2 blot's terrible. The antibody is not good in mice. So we'll go by the XIP ubiquitation. And you don't get RIP1 ubiquitation after MDP. That's known. The TNF is produced from this signaling pathway, activation. And then you get RIP1 ubiquitation. And this corresponds with a second wave, this second NF-kappa-B activation. I wanted to repeat this biochemically. Uh, uh, sorry. And in the tnf one knockout, of course, you have XIP ubiquitation occurring normally. It doesn't affect the first stage of this pathway. And you don't get this RIP1 ubiquitation further down. And you don't get activation after. So I wanted to repeat this biochemically, looking at the peritoneal cells in wild-type knockout mice. You see a strong induction of cytokines, IL-6. If I took out the TNF from the supernate and using a TNF-blocking antibody, I rendered the wild-type incapable of amplifying its signal. So now it's signaling the same as TNF-R1. So really we're seeing this raw NOD2 cytokine amount, no amplification. And so this is where I'm at now. I'm appreciating that there's real strong crosstalk between these two pathways and we're starting to ask, well, are they just doing in one go or is it looping back? Are they upregulating each other and talking? And that's sort of where I'm at in my PhD now. In the last leg, I'm asking these questions. And so this is sort of the end and I'm asking myself, what have I learnt from my PhD? What have I appreciated? Um, well, I have added to the field. I haven't just clarified two big groups that are sort of ignoring each other and saying, no, we're right. We're actually, you know, we're adding to the field. Where it's less murky now. And uh, adding a new aspect that perhaps can lead to further appreciation of this pathway. Another thing I really learned and appreciate is structural biology is hard and it doesn't always result in what you want. Um, so you've got to stick at it, and I will. I really want to continue this structural biology aspect and develop this RIPK2 compound. Collaboration is key to success. The things that I did, I went and knocked on Isabel Luce's door and said, teach me structural biology, and she did. And so really use the collaboration in your PhD. It was really helpful, um, and it was really good. And a big thing is that I have learned to appreciate my research in the bigger scheme, you know, we are combating disease, and so how does my research fit into disease? So if we sort of apply this philosophy, and I want to, <laughs> and I want to sort of quote uh, uh, Sun Tzu, why not? Um, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. So if we want to apply this to a more biochemical theme, if you know the disease and the related signaling pathway in detail, you need not fear it, for you can treat it or even prevent it. So applying this philosophy, let's <laughs> applying this philosophy, let's sort of bring it back to earlier in my talk. I mentioned that these peptidoglycans are found in multiple sclerosis patient lesions. So TNFR1 and TNFR2 are upregulated in multiple sclerosis patients. So is TNF. So we have TNF in the system and especially at the site of these lesions. So you have upregulation of both. Now, does anyone know what happens if you target multiple sclerosis patients with TNF blocking? Anyone? Yep. It goes badly. Yes, it goes badly. Thank you. It actually makes them worse, unlike what you'd think. So it makes the, the disease worse. I'm so glad someone answered then. That would have been very awkward. Um, <clears throat> so they're starting to realise that TNFR1 and TNFR2 have opposing roles in this disease. TNFR1 drives CNS inflammation and damage. And TNFR2 leads to repair. So you can't remove TNF completely from the system because you'll impact this pathway. That's where the main, you know, our protagonist, the Weihai 345, this kinase inhibitor and this pathway come in. 
Nod2 activity leads to TNF production and TNF R1 activation. So you can see how it could exacerbate the disease. If we use our inhibitor, it will not remove TNF from the system because there are other sources. It will just reduce this overall inflammation. And, and this is where we saw this protection in the mice and, and hopefully one day with our inhibitor in humans. On that little thought, on that philosophy, it's really what's left is the acknowledgements. Um, I will start with my supervisors. As John said, I've been, you know, seven years known them, um, over four years in PhD. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I had to show an embarrassing photo. I had worse. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And it's been an amazing time. So thank you. Um, next is Isabel Luce. I don't need to show a horrible photo. She's just been nice to me. So thank you, Isa. <laughs> um, thanks, Isa. You've been such a great support, and I look forward to working with you more. Um, the next big appreciative thank you is to the division. Uh, you guys are awesome. You're like a family at work. You're so kind, uh, interesting, and, and just, you know, it's, it's been really good. So you've all been really great. Um, Alexandra, James, and Sam, special mention from the division. You guys have helped in either purifying those proteins or getting me through the cloning steps of the crystal biology. That was horrible. Um, the committee, James Vince, Tracy, and Andrew Webb, great support throughout. Um, all the members of the MGC uh, people, again, you're all on the same floor, always interacting with you guys and allowing me to steal your stuff. Uh, the proteomics lab, Special mention to Jared Sandow. He's been awesome with the mass spectrometry, and we're trying to describe that lysine uh, ubiquitation on XIP, so that, that's exciting stuff. Immunology division, Ifan and Andrew, uh, both with the multiple sclerosis stuff in that Nature Comms paper. Chemical biology, Guillaume, from my honours. I did honours with him, and he's been a great support throughout. Uh, Christoph, Jeff, Onisha, and Waven in the structural biology and chemical biology. Kate Lawler, um, always happy, always smiling, and always, if I go up to her, ask me for help, she will be there. So she's been fantastic. The mouse techs um, did a lot of mouse work, and they helped me throughout. Special thanks to friends from the curry group and the dumpling group on Wednesday, um, and family and friends, uh, of course, throughout the whole PhD. It's, you know, it is a bit of a marathon. And a special thanks to Nan, who's here today, always reminding me and my friends on my Facebook wall that I'm handsome. So thank you, Nan. <laughs> um, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, there was a really clear talk, and I'm sure uh, we've got to grill him with lots of hard questions now. <laughs> and um, so, so you started off with not and found that um, really it was XIA. But then in your last summary diagram, <coughs> you were showing, I think on the left you meant to show the dendritic cell, yep. where the actual not sequence happened. And then on the right you have the TNF receptor 1 signaling in the macrophage, where you had uh, CIAP important. So why didn't the have, if that's the scenario, why couldn't you see anything, even an amelioration also in the CIP normals in the early experiments? So the, the earlier experiments were all in early time points as well, so up to two hours, because that's what everyone looked at. That's the turning on and the turning off the signaling pathway. Um, it's only after, so about four hours, that end point is when the TNFR1 activation kicks into high amounts that we can detect it. The whole literature really only looks at the early time, up to two hours mainly. They, we don't know why I can't repeat pretty much anything my cellar did. Um, we don't know why, but they did have mice on the embryonic stem cell background, which could also knock out other cells on that locus. So the CRP1 knockout could also have caspase 12 knocked out or caspase 11. So it could be that. Um, but I've looked at that also, it wasn't that. But it could be something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Speak to Dave, though, if you uh, <laughs> want to know about that paper. James. 
I didn't, um, of course, in the interest of time, and we should just have a look. But the fact that in the TNFR1 knockout it is so low already, TNFR2 isn't going to be playing a big role in this early part. So yes, I should, I should, but it, it won't make a big difference on that graph in the sensitivity. Justin. Shay, you showed a pretty nice experiment with varinopan implicating XIAP, ruling out CIAP, and you mentioned compound A, but I missed any experiment with compound A. Was it in there? Did you, did you use that as well to show more definitively? Yep, that was in the, um, the ubiquitilation. So the... Just a couple of lots. I got a bit lost. Yep, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to apologise, I love Western plots. Um, <laughs> so this experiment was showing Brunapan. Now, if I put compound A at these doses, it would be flatlining. The MDP pathway wouldn't occur. When you look at the ubiquitilation of RIP2, Brunapan is occurring, Brunapan treatment occurring normally, the half an hour, but in compound A at this half an hour, it's not happening. So that, that's where it was implicating. Okay. So that has been shown in the past in, in XIP <coughs> knockouts, you still get ubiquitilation and that's when they concluded, well, it's probably CIP1 and 2. Because there's no signaling happening downstream or lower, I don't think that CIP1 and 2 are needed for it, but perhaps because they're there at the complex, because XIP is gone, there's a free space, they may just be doing it uh, unregulated. Yep, so compound A, if this is the low dose of compound A. If I increased it, perhaps it would decrease more. I haven't tested it. But we're not degrading XIP from the system. It is still there. We're breaking it away somewhat, but it could be still binding. Or the other possibility is there's another E3 ligase in the system. That is the other one, and that could be it. Um, so yeah, it's been shown by us and others that XIP is needed to ubiquitate and that recruits loop back. So it's XIP first or another E3 case. <clears throat> David, at the start you mentioned that uh, some of the mutations in Crohn's disease are gain of function mutations to the nodes and some are loss of function. <coughs> Has any of your later work explained that conundrum? So the loss of function mutations, I'll give you an example, one in the, uh, the card domain. And it's not in the card that binds root 2, it's the other one. And they're saying it's because it doesn't bind to the endosome anymore. So it doesn't so really relate. Or <coughs> the mutations, a mixture. Yeah, so to get, the, to get the disease, you have to have a, if a loss of function, you have to be uh, homozygous loss of function. No, and you can be heter heterozygous. And you know, they, these mutations are really associated with the disease. So 30, you know, up to 30, 50% of Crohn's disease patients have these mutations. But of course, healthy people do as well. So it's always, you know, a multifaceted disease. But it, you can have a reduced function, so heterozygous, and it will still cause disease or progress disease. Back to answer the question. I mean, you've done, you've sorry, what was the question then? <laughs> Went off on a little rant there. No, no, I was still just wondering how gain of function to the same protein as loss of function causes the same disease, and whether any of your sorry, I forgot about that part. Yeah, yeah. So. So the loss of function is clear. Yeah. So the loss of function is clear, as, of course, um, but the gain of function is less clear. It's producing more cytokines in the system, so you're probably getting an inflammatory response. So you might be getting more immune cells. It's really not clear. It's known, but yeah, we don't. And to my research, I haven't looked at or thought of it really. So yeah. I guess following on from that question with the inhibitor, have you looked at their gut function? Is there any concern that you're compromising the sort of microbiome sort of function in the gut with your inhibitor? Well, the inhibitor treatments were really short treatments. This is not long term and it has a really short half life. This inhibitor is an infant, if you think of it as the drug. It's a small compound and we want to add to it. So it gets cleared out of the system really quickly. Because I showed you that NOT2 is important in homeostasis, yeah, it probably may cause uh, some disruption, but there are a lot of other um, receptors that are detecting and regulating this system as well. And this, this, this really targets root 2 very specifically. So just take, taking this pathway. 
I'm not sure you understood the question because he asked it in the knockout mice whether it was, uh, if I'm correct, that the, it was a, that the knockout mice <coughs> microbiome might be affected. No, I thought it was the inhibitor if it caused, disrupted the microbiome. Okay. Who's right? Who's right? No. <laughs> Asking about your philosophy, um, <laughs> so it seems to be based on the EAE model, right? And what's the effect of knocking out TNF in that EAE model? Isn't it good? I mean, that's why they tried it in the patients, and it doesn't work, right? Yeah. And isn't that your justification of using the inhibitors in, in humans? So, <clears throat> so if you knock out TNFR one in the mouse it protected the onset of disease. So they got excited and that's why it went to clinical trials in humans. That was, that was the, the real justification for it. And then humans got worse. They got w more lesions in the brain. And that is, then they had a couple of theories because of that. In mice, TNFR1, TNFR2 might be different in the humans. So TNFR2 might have a stronger role in this repair. Um, I wouldn't, because of that, I wouldn't say, well, so my inhibitor doesn't target the TNFR1 and 2, so it doesn't infect that. So we don't even need to consider whether or not you would be causing lesions targeting RIP2. We're reducing just a part of the TNF from the whole system. So you'll have other processes producing the TNF, so you'll get this repair mechanism and damage. But if we take a bit away of this TNF produced, it will protect some of the disease, and that's what we saw in the mouse anyway. So I don't think targeting RIP2 would cause more damage because it's not producing more TNF. You're still arguing that its beneficial effect is based on a mouse model that has not faithfully recapitulated beneficial effects of reducing TNF in human disease. Absolutely. So like any model, it's not, it is just a model. So I, I wouldn't try sell this compound to a multiple sclerosis patient just yet. <laughs> <laughs> cells were involved and then you've generated them in vitro. Could you tell us about the type of DCs you found in the peritoneum and the type of cultures you did to recapitulate them? Yep, so this is, our lab had never used dendritic cells, so we went and spoke to other people in the institute and we decided to use GMCSF um, to derive our dendritic cells. Um, in the peritoneum, we saw these large and small macrophage-like cells and the small macrophages were really low, so we wanted to use them, but it just, you can't use them. There's, there's too few, kill way too many mice. <clears throat> so we wanted to look at something, and it was purely based on this. They have to react immediately to MDP, so this MHC class two high, and they were those small peritoneal macrophages that we saw at high. Um, and these GMCSF are also <coughs> MHC class two high after the stimulation. So that, that is our justification for using the model. Um, but the literature itself, even surrounding GMCSF, is they all are still arguing: are they dendritic cells? So uh, you know, I would definitely appeal to knowledge throughout the institute to get a better model on that. Because I would suggest that the GM-derived DCs aren't actually present in the steady-state mouse. So if your reaction is very quick, mm. it's likely some other cell than a GMCSF-derived DC or monocyte. Yeah. So. Yeah, we'd absolutely like to look at other cell types for sure. Yeah, we, we fully appreciate that. It's just a surrogate uh, cell type, and it was because we could not get enough of the cell type that we were interested in to do the biochemical experiments. So, absolutely, it's a caveat. More questions. It's great, isn't it? It's running over time. <laughs> <laughs> It's an easy one. You suggested uh, multiple times that a number of phenomena occur both in mice and in man. Do they also occur in women? <laughs> no. Absolutely. Equality is important. <laughs> All right. I missed the questions. I have got no idea what was going on there. <laughs> but I do know that that was a great talk, and uh, just join me in thanking Jay for a great talk.